Hey there, my name's Eli, and today we are going to go over the new Atlas and ritual mechanics. First, let's discuss the new Atlas. The rules have changed. As we can see here from this overlay, this Atlas would have been impossible in the old rule set, as there are three watchstones here, two of the same color, and also two of the zones haven't been explored, one at all, and the other to the point where you couldn't possibly have run a Conqueror. So, the rules are now that you can essentially go anywhere at any time to get the Watchstones that you need in order to advance your Awakening level. And remember, every four Watchstones you place onto your Atlas gives you one Awakening level. Now let's recap just a little bit further. Under the old strategy, we would have a setup kind of like this. Once we got our first four watchstones from the four outer regions, Vastir, Haywork, there's corner, this corner, we would go and put stones into Tyrn's End, for example, and we would have two in Le Proxima, and then we would run Tyrn's End until we got all four conquerors. So we would just keep spamming this zone in order to get them, in order to force higher tier map drops to spawn only from Le Proxima. And then we would move forward here, we put three stones over here, like so, into Valdo's Rest, and then we would only run Le Proxima until we got, again, the four Conquerors in that zone and four more Watchstones, and we would repeat this around the circle until we had to go back to the four Outer Zones and get our next set there. With patch 3.13, however, we no longer are bound by this apparent rule set, which means we can effectively go anywhere on the Atlas to spawn our Conquerors in order to obtain more Watchstones. So while we can still follow this strategy of forcing our higher tier maps to spawn in only certain areas, and that's completely fine, we also have a new mechanic with the Maven that we need to consider. And the thing we have to consider are the little bars that hang out above our new Atlas Watchstone Citadels. Now let's cover the numbers on these real quick and what they mean. So when we go to our map device, we now have this little button right here. If it's orange and red, that means it's turned on, it's active. So any map that you put in here, it's going to do a check to see if the Maven will actually join you on this boss fight and watch over the fight. If we go ahead and put our Relic Chambers in, we can hover over and say, this region requires more Watchstones. Remember, we took them out for the Ural example. So let's go to New Vastir, which is down here. Okay, so let's put our Watchstones back in, right there. And we'll go back here, and we'll put it in. And now the Maven will witness this fight. So what this means is when I go to the boss fight in the Relic Chambers, the Maven will be there. She'll interfere in the fight in small ways. She'll either throw down an AoE circle that will maim you, or she will give the boss a health shield, or give the boss the ability to absorb damage. Things like this. Now once I do this one more time here, once I do the Relic Chambers boss with the Maven watching, she will drop an invitation for me. And the invitation will lead us into the Maven boss fight, where we then gain access to Atlas passive points. So there is a correlation between the amount of watchstones and the number of boss fights required in order for the Maven to actually join you on the map boss. What this means is, at the start, when you only need three bosses, you don't need any watchstones in that region. She will join you on any map. After you've received your invitation for that three boss fight and completed it, she'll now require four bosses. When she does this, that region will need one watchstone. Next up, when she wants five bosses, you'll need two watchstones in that region. When she needs six, you'll need three watchstones in that region. And when she wants seven or more, you need four watchstones. Also of important note here, my testing has shown that the Maven does care about maps that are native to a region. Let's use Glenich Cairns as an example. I have six, I need three watchstones. My lowest tier map is 10. So you would think, oh, if I bring in a tier 10 map of any of these Glenich Cairns maps, she'll accompany me. This is not the case. She will accompany you on a tier 10 arcade. She will not accompany you on a tier 10 grotto. Even though it is the correct zone, it is not the correct tier for the watchstone level. So why is this so exciting? Well, as all of you have probably seen, 
there are new Atlas passives. Every time you complete a group boss fight with the Maven, you get access to two more points. These passives are very powerful in terms of your farming capability. So we now have an impetus as the player to level up our Maven boss fights as much as possible in order to both scale difficulty of maps as well as our potential reward from those maps. When you couple that with the fact that now Conquerors can spawn in any zone without a care for whether it's an outer zone or an inner zone and where you are in that cycle, we now have more freedom as the player to essentially play whatever maps we get and we will continually be rewarded for this if we are putting watchstones in the correct places in order for the maven to level up along with our increased chances of higher tier maps. So what I mean by that is when I get watchstones, I want to place them wherever it is I have my highest tier map so that more maps in that area can spawn, yes, but also to make sure that the maven spawns with the boss fight because I want those Atlas passives. So the long and short of it is, the old strategy still does work in the fact that you can manipulate your Atlas as to what tier maps drop in which zone. You can block off other zones essentially by making one zone your highest tier, and that's perfectly fine. But you can also now spread out your watchstones and gather maps from multiple regions if you want to play that way too. And while this maybe isn't as efficient in terms of building your Awakening level, it is efficient in building your Maven level. So we have two things to build now, and because of that, it allows more options for how people want to play. I think this is very exciting. I think coupled that with the Atlas passives allowing us to focus on specific content, Grinding Gear has done an excellent thing for a broader part of the player base. All right, let's talk about rituals themselves. Each ritual has an AoE around it that you can see carved on the ground in kind of this runic symbol. Once you kill all the monsters that are in that circle, the ritual totem itself becomes clickable. Once you click on it, it will respawn all of the monsters you just killed, with the caveat that if this is your second ritual in this map, you also have to fight the monsters from the first ritual on top of this second ritual. This accumulates across all of the rituals in the map, no matter how many there are, so the final ritual will have all of those mobs, as well as the ones from every previous ritual. Each ritual that you complete in a map will reveal more items within the ritual that you can use your ritual points in order to buy or defer for later. If you simply hover over the item or hover over them after clicking on the defer button, you'll see the either the cost to buy it straight up or the cost to defer. Every time you defer an item, it lowers its total price. There is a limit to the number of items that you can defer, and that limit currently is 70. When you try to click on the 71st, you will get this message. In my testing, it took me over 20 rituals in order to stop seeing deferred items once I hit that 70 deferred item limit. However, even up to 10 rituals later, I could still find some of my deferred items if I re-rolled. So the next question is, in which order do items that are deferred stop showing up? I assumed that if I have a list of number 1 through 70, the ones closer to the start would be the first ones to go because they're the oldest ones, right? In my testing, I found this not to be the case. It was a little slice of hell to record 70 items individually and to keep track of which ones showed up when, but it turns out the deferment list is picking items essentially at random. I would see items that were in the first 10, as well as ones that were later near 70, as far as 25 rituals later, assuming I had re-rolled. So the moral of the story is deferred items stay around for quite some time. When you re-roll, which costs 2,000 points, you forego any items that you have not revealed yet in that ritual. The number of new items that you get is a variable around the amount of items that you had before. So let's say, for example, you had 15 items revealed in your ritual. When you hit reroll, you'll get anywhere, apparently, from between around 12 to 17 new items. Now, this list of rerolled items can include deferred, so actual new items might be lower depending on how many deferred items show up. And when you reroll, those new rerolled items are going to show up for the rest of the map. So if you happen to reroll on your very first ritual, those new items will be there for the remainder of that map. However, when you reroll, you lose the ability to unlock new items. The ritual totems themselves provide buffs or attack you. 
And while there's certainly going to be more details to come, here's the list of ones that I've run into myself. First and foremost is the triple frost beam. This one is the best one in my opinion for us as the player because all of the monsters spawn in the center right on top of the ritual itself instead of random locations. Next up we have the infernal totem which drops meteors on you periodically it seems about every 8 to 10 seconds. We have the cage of lightning death ritual which encircles the ritual area with totems that will shoot large lightning balls across to each other. There is a wind up animation for the totem, the beams are really huge and they're kind of slow so they're pretty easy to dodge. We have the haunted ritual which spawns extra tormented spirits, this is also pretty great for extra loot drops. We have the emboldening totem which picks targets and makes them larger and presumably they attack faster, have more hit points, this kind of thing. There's one that drops fortress totems which presumably buff our enemies in terms of their defenses. And there's probably more, but you get the idea. The totems effectively help the enemies and try to hurt you. And yes, if a ritual totem spawns in the boss room and you have subsequent ritual totems to activate, those bosses will spawn with those subsequent rituals. On a related note, if you do a ritual that has a boss mob in it in one map and you use your blood vessel on that ritual totem after it's completed and then use that blood vessel onto a new map, every ritual that you use in that subsequent map is going to spawn that boss monster. So keep that in mind. So if you're like me and you've been checking the Reddit periodically, you might have seen every now and again a post come up where someone's had a super valuable item and they haven't even been able to defer it because it costs so many ritual points. So the question is, how do we get more ritual points? In my testing, it appears that map tier doesn't have anything to do with how many ritual points you can get. I did a tier 13 with 21% increased pack size, and then I did a tier 3 that was completely white, no mods, and I got more total favor points out of the tier 3. So it's unclear if pack size has an impact because there does appear to be a natural variance that you can get no matter what mods you have or don't have on a map. Now what does appear to affect it is whether you have vessels invested into the map. So you can take a vessel that's empty and use it on a completed ritual, preferably the last one in one map, and then take that into the map device for your next map. You can do this with multiple filled vessels. In my testing, for non-vesseled maps, I generally landed around 5,000 favor points. With one vessel into a map, I ended up around 5,800, and with two vessels, I ended up around 73, 7,400. So it does appear that while there is some random chance in terms of the layout of the map, more open space seems to be better to allow more monsters to spawn within the ritual zone, having more filled vessels put into the map device with the map itself seems to be the biggest factor in terms of getting overall total ritual points. As a side note, this does make it a little bit more important to unlock that extra slot in your map device so that you can put in four filled vessels instead of just three. And finally, some extra notes on what I've found that I thought were interesting. You can only use one vessel on a completed ritual site. You can't use two and just load up. If you bring higher tier mobs into a lower tier map, those higher tier mobs can drop higher tier maps. So for example, that was kind of a weird sentence. If you fill a vessel from a tier 12 and then use that vessel in the map device with a tier 5, monsters that spawn on subsequent rituals can drop tier 12 maps. And finally, if you use a filled vessel on a map in order to boost it, you cannot use empty vessels within that boosted map. That's all I've got for you for right now. I do plan on making this sort of a living video and I will pin a comment at the top in order to have updated information as I find it out or any corrections that have to be made, hopefully none. But because it's a new league and the rules haven't been completely sussed out, I'm going to allow for the possibility that I might have made a mistake. I do everything I can to test and retest to make sure what I'm saying is true, but I've also streamed for like 30 hours in the past three days and because of that, it's possible I may have made a mistake somewhere. One way or another, I'm very much enjoying this league and I will be making further videos on the Maven fight and how to effectively make money in this league. Watch out for those videos, they're coming. So until I see you again, stay sane, exiles.